Um, so I might just uh, begin with a short ethnographic story. So um, while I was conducting ethnographic fieldwork in Assam, northeast India, I attended a puja and it took place on top of a hill. And this hill was used as a shifting cultivation site for growing rice uh, for, for a small community uh, that lived in the forest close to Guwahati. And for those of you who don't know, Guwahati is the major city of northeast India. So after completing my observations, um, I decided to descend the hill with my friends, but from the opposite side from which we came, because it provided a more direct route down to the, my bikes that waited by a stream below. But unfortunately, the, the descent was incredibly steep. There were no clear paths, and as you can see, the, the rice straw was incredibly healthy and tall, and pretty much we couldn't see anything, so consequently we got lost, veered off course, and in order to correct our approach, we had to kind of cut our way back across the hill. But uh, there was a problem because there was a rocky gully. And from our vantage, we were unable to ascertain where it was safe to cross and indeed how to get to that point to cross. But luckily for us, we stumbled upon the recent track of an elephant herd that had ascended the hill and crossed its way across the shifting cultivation fields. And unfortunately for the farmer, they had crushed a lot of these rice straw, but fortunately for us, their heavy bodies had opened up a fresh path that seemed to be going in the direction that we wanted to go. So, considering we didn't know what we were doing, we trusted in the elephant's better judgment and the clear passage that the path afforded, and we followed the track, which negotiated the steep hill, found and found the appropriate crossing at, at, on the rocky gully, and also pointed us in the right direction back down to the stream, which I assume the elephants also went to. So, while this track is only a temporary trace, uh, when I used to walk occasionally through the forested hills next to my field site in Guwahati, my meanderings would sometimes become entangled with the more permanent paths of elephant herds that used to move through the area. When the herds revisit the same route over time, the heavy feet, their heavy feet can give away to a flat, wide and hardened track that cuts a clear path through vegetation. In Assamese, a path that's frequently trafficked by elephants is called dundi. However, dundi aren't used nor given shape by elephants alone. So different animals, and especially the humans that live nearby to the forest and depend on its resources, will often participate in these trails. So yeah, I think, I think that's an... Honestly, I, I just found this on my hard drive, but I'm pretty sure that's an elephant path. I have to check my GPS things, but yeah. So, while I've begun in the ethnographic present and at a field site that I'm very familiar with, instead, uh, my paper is going to take a turn towards the past, towards a place that I'm relatively unfamiliar with. And I want you to present some um, just a number of historical tidbits that I've picked up during my research, where I being, became quite interested in the idea of um, where elephant trails were mentioned within the historical literature. And and I'll, my paper will argue that the elephant, that elephant trails in part enabled humans to occupy the difficult upland terrain of northeast India and beyond. So, to begin, to begin, I'll briefly consider what a forest path is, and then I'll illustrate how communities, British soldiers, and also were, and elephants, of course, were entangled along shared trails in the Mizo Hills in the 19th century. I'll then briefly analyse a biography of Alisu, who migrated from Upper Burma to India in the 60s. And then also, um, I'll just talk about how interspecies trails are part of a mutual ecology, a co-constructed niche in which humans and elephants live. And I'll also consider towards the end as well that about maybe the possibility of a more than human history of upland Asia. Okay, so what's a path? So, for ecological psychologist James Gibson, a path is an affordance. An affordance is a quality of the world that emerges from the interaction between an organism and the environment, whereby that quality enables the organism to perform a particular action. So, when an organism engages a path, for instance, which in a forest might be a clearing through vegetation, it perceives an aspect of the environment that enables movement. Humans and elephants are both dramatic ecological engineers. Their activities directly or indirectly modifying the niche within which they live. 
but that also their activities and modifications also alter the affordances available to them. So paths are environmental modifications that enable movement, but also simultaneous, but also they simultaneously constrain it, right? So paths also guide and shape the course of an organism's behaviour. So the custom of following trails allows the traces of past travellers to scaffold and guide the trajectories of future ones. So it's just like when we walk on a path in some ways the work that we're required to do to orient ourselves in relationship to a destination, we don't have to worry about that anymore because the path does the work for us. So we can just walk through the forest looking at our mobile phones, for example. Further, to engage an elephant path is not simply to be guided by it, but also to participate in its making. Trails are aspects of a shared ecological niche that are constructed by interactions among multiple species over long periods of time and can serve as affordances for a wide variety of animals. Human and free-roaming free roaming elephant movement do not simply overlap, but intertwine. Their behaviours are coordinated by the constraints of the forest pathways that they mutually give shape to. So, if anthropocentric bias has ignored how captive elephants were vital to the formation of South Asian society, whether it's as beasts of bur burden, beasts of war, transport animals, um, timber, timber logger elephants, then we might be able to say that the same oversight exists for elephant paths or elephant ecosystem engineering. Of course, it's not, these things are never un entirely unacknowledged, right? So there are references to the paths within colonial literature, for example. So here, produced the Lieutenant Douglas Hamilton, he admired how the paths that elephants make over the range of hills they frequent are quite wonderful examples of engineering and one cannot help but being, by sh but being struck with the skill with which they are traced. The gradients are truly wonderful, avoiding every steep and difficult accent, ascent by regular zigzags. And then in South India, we have Mr. Ball, a botanist who praised the way that elephants assisted him to perform his research. So on most of their hills, the elephants have made paths with a gentle ascent. Where these existed, I was enabled to do my work, which made me frequently bless them and regard them, no matter what they might be to the Riots, as at least my benefactors. Quite a nice way of thinking elephants being our benefactors. In the northeast, British colonial surveyors, entrepreneurs and military encountered a difficult terrain composed of densely forested hills. The Pakhoi, a mountainous range on the Indo-Myanmar border, was characterised by the British as dominated as or dramatically characterised by the British as dominated by slavers and raiders and covered with the almost impervious jungle, traversed only by paths used principally by wild elephants and as the war traps of tribes. Conflict between the British Army and upland communities around the Mizo Hills, or the Wushai Hills, as the British called it at the time, were very, are pretty well documented. The colonisers were involved, involved in a protracted war that lasted perhaps over 50, 40 to 50 years, with particular communities who disrupted British tea gardens and other outposts that encroached on indigenous territories. In response, colonial forces decided to advance into the hills to exert control and force submission. In the accounts of the Mizo Hills incursion, particularly in 1871 and 1872, because they, okay, so just a bit of a background, the British did try to go out and do an incursion during the late 50s, but unfortunately they found the environment too challenging. But there was such a problem during the 70s, the colonial government decided they had to go teach the offending communities a lesson, I guess. so. In these accounts, they, there's a lot of mentions of elephant paths being used in order to get inside the interior. So when the British came across the Mizo Hill communities during the mid-19th century, we found that they found a community that were intimately engaged with free-roaming elephants with whom they lived alongside. So Mizo settlements were actually organised in relation to um, elephant movement. So uh, fields were planted, like uh, shifting cultivation fields were planted to avoid pre-established routes. And some villages were also settled on top of hills at the end of all very old elephant trails. And of course, the Mizo at the time were also very were proficient and still are, I guess, proficient elephant hunters. And elephant body parts performed a significant part of economic trade with the neighbouring plains. So, British forces, when they were marching to the Mizo hills, found it sparsely inhabited with few established trails and the only way that they could progress was by following the riverbanks or the paths of elephants. The Mizos, as local inhabitants and elephant hunters, unsurprisingly had a very intimate knowledge of these network of elephant paths and used to exploit them themselves, 
and in turn the British exploited the knowledge of local Mizo neutral communities in order to um, in order to further themselves in the hills. And in some cases the elephant piles were so good in such good quality that they looked in parts as neatly defined as if they had been done by hand. However, not sculpted by elephant foot alone, the British found paths that led to Mizo villages that were engineered by wild elephants and improved and used by the Mizo. In turn, apparently old Mizo trails were also reciprocally maintained for other mega herbivores that lived in the area, so elephants, but of course there were rhinos in the area at that time as well. In some cases as well, the army themselves further widened the tracks to facilitate the march of soldiers and transport of items further into the interior too. So, more broadly, elephant paths afforded the flow of people through the dense jungle, and it was along these co-produced interspecies trails that British were able to advance into the hills, survey the area, subjugate the population, and then you know, colonise the periphery of British India. So, this exploitative relationship of another animal's ecosystem is not exceptional. Yesterday we heard from Andrew's excellent talk about the relationship between elephants, cattle herders in Uganda, the example I wanted to offer was um, American settlers, settlers in Ohio Valley in North America. So when the American settlers came in, they followed an extensive system of buffalo trails. And Jekyll argues that American settlement was firmly rooted in the changing ecological complex of the American Indian and the bison. So likewise, when the British advanced into Mizo Hills, they became intertwined in a co-constructed ecological niche, a biotic and abiotic environment shaped by Mizo and elephant communities for a few hundred years. Participating in shared pathways, the British, the elephants and the Mizo became coordinated as partners in the formation of place and history. The trails were an environmental interface that connect indirectly and directly connected each actor at social and behavioural levels. So, zooming out a little bit now, thinking on an evolutionary kind of scale, Archaeologist Gary Haynes argued that mega herbivores during the Pleistocene era not only engineered ecosystems but also contributed information and enhancements to human foraging efficiency, thereby, thereby helping to make some rapid explorations, dispersals, and colonizations so successful. So, in other words, human migration and evolutionary history was entangled with the lives and niches of, of modern elephants' proboscideans' ancestors. Marion Lloyd a mid-20th century missionary in Mizoram offered a similar observation for the Pakhoi range, calling elephants discoverers, saying it was they, who in the West especially, first opened up a number of important paths over mountains and through deep valleys. <coughs> Following in the footsteps of elephants, in Marion Lloyd's opinion, enabled human, human populations to colonise the hilly regions and move over high passes along the Indo-Myanmar border. Some of these people would have had a significant impact on the social and biological ecology of Northeast India. The Christian missionary Eugene Morse's account of the Lisu community fleeing upland Burma in the 60s from the military junta illustrates how the persistent traces of elephant movement assisted in migration. In Morse's book, Exodus to a Hidden Valley, elephant paths were environmental features identified as determining the success of Lisu migration. The Lisu traversed a mountainous area west towards the border of India, up close to the, so the Sorkhan Pass. If you, any, any of you guys know, the Sorkhan Pass was also mentioned in Peter Illustrations' Elephant Gold, where he reported that Errol Gray saw feet carved into the sandstone on a very high pass, about 8,000 feet on the Indo Myanmar border. And Peter Stracy speculated that it probably perhaps supported generations of elephants passing in between India and Burma. Morse noted that the terrain that they were moving through towards India in, up, in Upper Burma was long uninhabited, that there were no dedicated human roads, and to cover the remote and hostile environment, they followed, as all people do, the narrow animal trails. So when the Lisu were moving, of course they weren't always following elephant paths all the time, but they were cutting their own way with machetes, but elephant paths were, sig were significantly mentioned. Travellers would often assemble and orient themselves at the junction of elephant paths, and when they went to ascend steep hills, they would follow the zigzagging tracks of herds. When the Lisu was dis were discussing which routes were possible, and they were sceptical of which high passes that might be achieve achievable, they also trusted in the existence of elephant paths to follow, 
claiming the tracks would make their ascent easy and show where to cross between the higher ridges. And while the Lisu occasionally and opportunistically killed elephants during the migration and settlement, they also interestingly expressed a, a customary hesitancy to kill them as well. And they said it's because elephants were such good trail makers. Now, we've been, I've been exploring how trails are a kind of structural feature of a shared environment, but I want to think a bit beyond that now too. And I want to draw on anthropologist Chris Tilley, who notes that a path is a paradigmatic cultural act since it follows the footsteps inscribed by others, whose steps have worn a conduit for movement, which becomes the correct or best way to go. It's a kind of interesting way of thinking about paths, because in this respect, trails are historical traces of elephants' way of life, right? So they are traces of relationships of elephant communities moving between foraging sites across time. They are patterns of behaviour and social patterns as well that were nurtured within a lifetime and across generations and will also continue to guide the generations, future generations too. When we think about the Lusu, it becomes more interesting because the best way to go for the Lusu had actually already been inscribed into the landscape by elephants themselves. By following the routes over high passes that elephants would take, the Lisu participated in, an intergener in the intergenerational habits and knowledge of these trail makers. The lines between human and non-human became blurred as the Lisu's own trajectory became intertwined with and guided by the elephant benefactors who came before them. So by following these paths, we could say that the Lisu became part of a more than human history. So I'm going to start winding down and whilst it's completely outside the scope of my expertise and this paper, um, this interspecies relationship has potentially broader implications for thinking about a more than human history of upland Asia. In particular, I'm thinking about the interconnected hilly, hilly range that spreads from northeast India and the Pak Khoi through Burma, southern China, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, which most recently James C. James C. Scott referred to as Zonia. So we know that for thousands of years elephants flourished throughout Asia prior to aggressive state-driven agricultural expansion, and up until the 20th century, herds ranged extensively through Zomia. And interestingly enough, Zomia is also one of the last remaining bastions for surviving elephant populations. Jean-Michel estimates that modern humans began colonising the region, region some four to 5,000 years ago. Zomia is a geography shaped by the constant migration of diverse, by diverse, relatively isolated ethnic communities living amongst difficult terrain and moving between lowland states. Upland communities such as the Lisu and the Mizo have been to differing degrees in vital exchange with and contributing to the formation of powerful lowland states, sharing a deep history of symbolic, economic and human traffic. So if Zomia can be characterised by the challenges of its terrain and the shifting population, then I think the history of this space could have been facilitated, at least in parts, by the landscape modification of free-roaming elephants. As I've been harping on for the entire paper, wide open paths afford better access and offer guidance through upland areas. So in some ways, free roaming elephants play the role in the unfolding social and political history of Asia. So to, to conclude. Paths are important aspects of human and elephant niches. This paper asks that when understanding patterns of human behavior, we take into account indirect interaction with free-roaming elephants through co-constructed trails. The movement of both species in the difficult terrain of northeast India and beyond were in parts intertwined and coordinated. Human migration narratives, settlement patterns, social and political history were structured and afforded by elephant ecosystem engineering. And to colonise in the footsteps of elephants is to take part in the historical traces of elephants with whom, with whom humans share place. So, Humans don't necessarily forge their own paths into the unknown, but as anthropologist Tim Ingold notes, very often humans take over where non-humans have left off. Thank you.